Episode 27, The Ending Days, Red Reaping and Red Tape, by Captain E.J. Needham, read by Michael Charter. Captain Needham, from whose enthralling war diary has taken this most human story of the grey days of the Great Retreat, was with the 1st Battalion, the Northamptonshire Regiment. He and his men were reeling drunk with fatigue day after day. His stirring narrative begins on August the 28th, 1914, the fifth day of the retreat, and ends with orders on the 5th of September to advance again towards the Marne and the Aisne in pursuit of the retiring enemy. After five days of continual retreating, having scarcely fired a shot or even seen the enemy, everyone's nerves were on edge and it was becoming increasingly difficult to keep the men, and ourselves too for that matter, cheery. They kept asking why we were retiring. Why did we not turn and wipe the Huns off the earth? What was the French army doing, etc., etc.? We, knowing no more than they did, could only tell them that it was a strategical retirement and that we were already retiring to a prearranged and already fortified position, that our retirement would only last one day or more. Talk of the fog of war. I shall never forget the last halt we were to have that night. As usual, everybody, officers and men, threw themselves down just at the edge of the road. When the whistles blew, fall in, many of the men lay where they were, not in the mutinous spirit, but just because they were physically incapable of getting up. My platoon was the rear platoon of the company, which was the rear company of the battalion. Paker, a fellow officer, and I went round actually kicking men till they got up and threatening with our revolvers drawn to shoot any man who did not fall in at once. We were reeling about like drunken men ourselves, past hoping for any rest, but knowing we had to go on. At last we got them all on the move and struggled along in the rear to prevent any men from falling out. About two miles on, at about 1.30 a.m., we found the battalion was wheeling to the left through a gateway. The brigade staff captain was standing by it and told us when we went through that we were to bivouac in the field and were to stay there the whole next day. I do not remember much about getting into that field or what happened afterwards, except that another officer, Joe Farrat, and myself lost ourselves trying to find out where the rest of the officers had to go and seeing a water cart threw ourselves under it and went to sleep at once. When we woke up in the morning, we found we were under one of the 60th water carts, that the whole brigade was bivouacked in the field, quite a small one, and that all the units were hopelessly mixed up together. It had been absolutely pitch dark when we got in, and nobody had been able to find anyone else, but everyone else had more or less dropped down where he was. How lucky the Germans were not close on our tracks that night and did not attack. The next morning, Sunday the 29th of August, we sorted ourselves out. The officers got their valises and managed to get a good wash, shave and general clean-up. The first we'd had since the 21st at Etchamo. It was a lovely hot day and we spent it lazing about in the sun, sleeping and eating. It was a real joy to have a day off and especially enjoyable to be able to shave and have a really good wash. All day long we could hear the sullen roaring of the French and German guns behind us. It was very pretty where we were, and except for the aforesaid noise of battle, very peaceful. The next day, August the 30th, we are off again. I know that the regimental war history states that we marched before dawn, but according to my diary, we departed at 5.30am. We marched through lovely wooded and hilly country, but it was again terribly hot, and our feet were, if anything, more tender than ever after our one day's rest. Though in other respects, all ranks were much fresher for it. We were very pleased when we arrived at ainsy le chateau which was a very pretty place, with enormous chateau and park, the former having been turned hastily into a hospital. The officers of the 48th were extremely lucky in being billeted in the chateau, and had a very comfortable night. The men, too, were all under cover and comfortable. 
Many of them bathed in the stream that ran through the grounds of the chateau, but personally I did not fancy it as the water looked very muddy and was also somewhat smelly. However, they seemed to enjoy it. During the march that day, while we were resting at the side of the road in the wood, during a ten-minute halt the Scots Greys came along and the Twelfth Lancers. They'd had a very hard day of almost continuous rearguard fighting about three days before, including a fine and very effective charge, and our men lined the road and cheered them lustily. Many of the horses looked as hard as nails, but fine drawn and worn out. The Grey's horses had all been painted with iodine or some substance to make them less conspicuous, and they were all dirty and of khaki colour. There were many empty saddles amongst their ranks. I asked what happened to my cousin, Archie Seymour, and was told he had been sent down to the base, as his ankle had been giving him a lot of trouble and was too painful to allow him to ride. We saw the Greys frequently during the retreat, as their cavalry brigade was working with the first corps all the time. The next morning we marched again at 5.30am. Very sorry to leave our comfortable quarters. It was again very hot, and we had the dreary, trying and exhausting march. We marched through the town of Soissons, coming down to it off the hills to the north, through some very pretty woods. On the south side of the town we were faced with a long and very steep hill, which proved a most severe test for the wretched transport horses. There were several dead horses lying at the side of the road, having been shot, as they were too far gone with exhaustion to get up the hill, or even to be fed. Poor beasts, mostly heavy draught horses, which only a few weeks before had probably been leading a more or less peaceful life down on some farm. We finally bivouacked for the night in a field, as usual, all pretty well worn out. We started off again on September the 1st, at the crack of dawn. We halted for some time during the afternoon and listened to a very heavy firing going on behind us and to our right. This, it afterwards transpired, was a severe rearguard action by the 4th Guards Brigade of the 2nd Division, in which they had very heavy casualties. Towards evening we marched through Masul sur Ok and took up a defensive position in the woods on the high ground to the south of the river. While the engineers were busily employed blowing up the various bridges over the river Ork, it was pitch dark night. Heavy firing was going on apparently all around us and everybody was expecting something exciting to happen at any moment. Motorcyclist dispatch riders were going up and down the road through the woods, which ran through a deep cutting on the slopes of which we were. It was an eerie feeling to sit there, hearing the booming of the guns all around, and to hear the motorcyclists tearing up and down the road with no lights and being challenged by the sentries posted on the road. At one moment we heard one tearing by and then a terrific crash, and there's silence. It transpired that one of them had crashed head-on into a barricade placed across the road. Oddly enough, years after I was speaking to a friend of mine, one Jim Brocklebank, who had been a dispatch rider at the beginning of the war and was telling him of this particular occurrence, he says, yes, and I was that unfortunate devil. It appeared that he'd been blinding up the road all out and had never heard the sentry's challenge above the roar of his engine and the noise of the guns and run smack into the barricade. The next he remember was hearing an English voice saying, "Cool, blimey, the bleep is alive, which told him he was amongst friends. He was pretty badly smashed up and his machine was in little bits. The next morning, the second, we were off again at 2.30am, another very hot and dusty march, and the air was thick of rumours as well as dust. This continued marching in the wrong direction was beginning to get on everybody's nerves, and it was getting increasingly difficult to keep the men cheerful. They could not understand it, and neither could we, for that matter, but otherwise they were simply surrounded. No one who did not go through that retreat can possibly imagine what it was like. Up and away, at dawn, every day, marching all day in tropical sun and amidst clouds of dust, or pushed down into the equally rough and very stony gutter by other columns of troops on the same road. 
or by staff cars rushing past and making the dust worse than ever. Never any proper meals, never a wash or shave, never out of one's clothes, carrying a terrific weight of arms and equipment, and, as regards the second brigade, never getting a chance of a shot at the enemy, except that one day it was in me to cheer one up a bit. Additional difficulty on the road, and one very corruptible to the moral of the troops, was the continuous stream of refugees going along the same roads as ourselves. The terrible tragedy of those poor people, hobbling along the road with all their worldly goods piled up, layer on layer, and crazy handcarts, perambulators, wheelbarrows, farm carts, etc., with generally the old grandfather and grandmother on top of all the goods, and all the rest of the family, women and children, that is, as all the younger men were with the forces, trailing along in the dust as best they could. Needless to say, the men insisted on sharing their meagre rations of bully beef and biscuits with them, and often, if they got the chance, took a hand to push along the nondescript vehicles. But it was horrible and it was demoralising. One felt all the time that they were cursing us, the wonderful British army that they had greeted so marvellously when we had gone up to the line, and which was now in full retreat, compelling them to leave their homes like this, or fall into the hands of the hated Germans. Some of them did curse us too and spat at us, but the majority plodded painfully, thankful for any little help we could give them and apparently oblivious to their future or fate. Nobody knew what happened to them that night, but every day they were plodding, 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 and the further south they went, the larger grew this other ghastly army, the refugee army. Red Tape took a hand at this time too, in what seemed to us the most unnecessary manner. All along the roads of France grew fruit trees, mostly apple, now in full fruit. Naturally, all of us, officers and men, picked this fruit as we halted. It was nourishing and refreshing to our dust-parched throats and palates. What possible harm could this have done to anybody but the pursuing Hun? The inhabitants had all left the countryside, and everything edible left was food for the enemy. The same applied to the food, bread, chocolate, etc., left behind in the shops, the owners of which had fled. Why should we have not been allowed to eke out our rations with them, and why must they be left to feed the enemy? Yet day after day I saw staff officers riding down the road, giving orders for this and that man's name to be taken for stealing fruits in a friendly country. What utter rot! The same thing applies to the herds of cattle left grazing in the fields to a certain extent. In one case, some regiment I forget which, did drive a large herd before them for days, and these were, I believe, eventually sent down by train to the base to be turned into beef for the troops. But I expect they got into trouble for it. If the cattle could not be driven by us, why should they not be shot instead of being left behind to feed the Germans? I can now tell the powers that were there that the PBI officers and men had many harsh things to say about these things I felt this show of useless red tape very bitterly. On this day it was, I think, that the remnants of the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Munster Fusiliers, about two officers and 70 other ranks, came through us. They had been cut to pieces that day on the river at Oise, when C Company had so nearly been cut off themselves at Thanels. The messengers who were sent to them with orders to retire were killed before getting to them and with the consequence that they never got their orders, were surrounded by the Germans and had to cut their way out with appalling casualties. We got into the bivouac of 5.30 that evening in a field just north of Mieux, only 20-odd miles north of Paris, and the joy of joys, there was mail in, the first we'd had since we left Esquire. I had some welcome letters, but none of the cigarettes and tobacco which I was longing for all the money which my letters had told me had all been sent. I was now down to my last 15 francs. Our bivouac this night was fairly buzzing with rumours, the chief and most popular being that we had finished foot-slogging for the time being and were to entrain the next morning for Paris to form part of its defence. The staff captain of brigade told us he heard this and believed it to be true, which sounded fairly straight from the horse's mouth. 
I thoroughly enjoyed my letters and papers. It was good to hear from the outside world after all this long time. But I miss my cigarettes. After some food and a final look through my letters and papers, I was not sorry to turn in and sleep the sleep of the just on the hard ground. We started the next morning at 4.30am, and instead of in training to Paris as we had been led to believe we were supposed to do, we marched east to La Ferte Sougeur, where we took up a position on some hills of the north bank of the river and town. This position had a very good field of fire, but we did not at all fancy it as, if attacked in force, we should have to retire down the hill, through the town and over the one bridge across the river Marne. It was reported that large bodies of Germans had been seen marching west to east. On our march from Mure to La Ferte, we'd seen a rather fine sight. The entire 5th Cavalry Brigade, Scots Greys, 12th Lancers and 20th Hussars, riding in open country parallel to and on the left of our line of march. They made a very inspiring sight. They were acting as flank guard to the 1st Corps and had, of course, their flanking patrols out to the left front. After we had been on our hilltop above La Ferte for some hours, we held orders to retire and recross the river, which we were very pleased to do. The town of La Forte seemed full of inhabitants who gave us fruit and chocolate and who were most anxious to know if the Germans were coming behind us. Of course, we had to tell them they were not, which seemed to me an awful shame, but it was necessary to prevent a panic and the roads by which the British Army was retired being completely blocked with still more refugees. As we were going through the town, my old friends in the 12th Lancers came past, and Jack Eden, who was one of my oldest and best friends at Eton, and the elder brother of Mr Anthony Eden, he was killed in Mons de Cats in October 1914, reported that they had been almost into Chateau Thierry, had not seen the Germans though the latter town appeared to be in flames. As we marched over the bridge, the sappers were busy preparing their demolition charges, and I for once felt very sorry for the inhabitants of Lafert, who were to be cut off from the retreat to the south. We went into billets at the tiny village called Romanet, about one and a half miles south of the river, and shortly after we were settled in, we heard the terrific reports of the bridge being blown up. The next day, the 4th, we paraded at 3 a.m., but we had, marvel of marvels, a very easy day. We marched across the country a bit and halted for some time at the junction of our track of the route nationale. At this juncture, we had the edifying spectacle of about half a dozen staff cars with their gilded staff and their drivers, all busy washing. After a while, we pushed on. About four miles further on, we were marched through a gateway on the right of the road, up a long track to a delightful old farmhouse, with a lot of outbuildings and an enormous walled fruit garden. We were told we should be here for the rest of the day, and the officers would have their valises. There was a little rustic stream running through the grounds, and in this we bathed to our joy. Also to our joy, we got our valises, and we were able to really have a proper wash and shave for the first time in five days, and put on clean shirts, socks, etc., the wall garden was full of fruit, pears, peaches, plums, apricots, apples, etc., in perfect eating condition, and the owners having left the farm, we were actually allowed to help ourselves, which we most certainly did. Never had fruit tasted better than that fruit. For the next two hours, the garden was full of all ranks occupied in picking and eating. Then everybody lay about in the shade and slept. It was another scorching day and it was most pleasant lying there with nothing to do but laze and watch the aeroplanes, our own and hostile, busy making their reconnoitering. We did make an early start the next morning at 2.30am, and marched off in a south-westerly direction. As we turned out of the gate, onto the main road, we saw eight or ten dead Germans and horses lying on the grass at the side of the road. It appeared that a sentry group of, I think, either the Black Watch or the Cameron Highlanders of the 1st Brigade had heard a cavalry patrol riding through them on the grass at the side of the road. It was a very dark night, and they had let them get close enough to let fly with their machine guns and also given them 15 rounds rapid. They had wiped out the entire patrol. We marched on through the town of Colomniere, 
a biggish place where the usual hurried departure of the inhabitants was, as always these days, taking place. Galway Warren, our transport officer, managed to buy or win, I'm not sure which, the hooded two-wheel cart into which Ulan, our captured enemy warhorse, was harnessed and which, I believe, he afterwards drew for many years. Galway had done awfully well with the horses throughout the retreat, and I do not think we'd lost more than two horses at most, if that. He had won a good-looking blood chestnut which had been strayed to us from from cavalry regiment, and which he'd annexed for himself. I found I was for the night outpost, which did not please me at all, as I was feeling very rotten, with the most awful pain in my middle, and also feeling very sick. In addition, the villages were full of rumours of likely attack by the Huns that night. I got my men told off and in position, and as it happened we had a very quiet night, with no alarms or excursions whatsoever, for which I was truly thankful. During the early part of the night, Paker came round to see me and told me that Guy Robinson had been to divisional headquarters that evening to get orders for the brigade, and had been told that the retreat was over and that on the morrow we were to advance. Great news. So ended the retreat from Mons. Thank you.